Thank you so much. I'm so excited to be here. There's just so much great energy here, and I, it's really such an honor. And if there's anything I want you to get out of this, it's to just, I'm going to give you examples of how anything is possible, because all of those things that you've read off, if I had followed like the rules, none of those would have happened. And it's really, my story is one more, I call it enthusiastic desperation, right? <laughs> when you really want to do something and everyone, for there's no reason why it should work, and then you think, well, what the heck, why not? I will just try it. And growing up, I really related with Matt's story yesterday. Was anyone here last night when he was talking about his teacher? So my, the first time I realized that I, had, I could do something that I liked that other people connected with, fifth grade in Mrs. Mayhem's class. And at the time, I was you know, the only chubby brown girl in like all of fifth grade at my school. And I didn't know that. I didn't realize that's what made me different. I knew I was different from everyone else, but I didn't know what it was. And, but there was just something where I was kind of the odd girl, sort of. But every time I would write a story in Miss Mayhem's class, she would have me stand up and read it to all of the fifth grade. And in those moments, like seeing all of my classmates pay attention and laugh and cheer and clap, I was like, I love this feeling. I love this moment. And I just remembered that feeling of like, wow, this is something special of writing these stories and drawing a little figure to go with it, a little story. And as time went on, my brother, my older brother, you know, typical older, he excelled in math and science and all these glorious things. And my parents were like, well, what do you love to do? And I'm like, write stories and draw pictures and glitter and glue and sequins. And my dad was like, well, I don't know if there's really a career with that. So let's like, let's break this down. How about you like to do writing? So maybe you go work for the newspaper, like you, you strive to go through school, because everyone will always need a newspaper. Like there, people till the end of time will always have a newspaper to read the news. And I'm like, that's smart, Dad. You're, yes, I'm going to do that. So I went through the newspaper route. Through um, high school, I was on the staff for there. I went to a community college. I was on the staff for there. I met my husband, who was an artist. We were bailiff's assistants at the traffic court. And he would draw the figures for the newsletter for the, the court, courtroom employees. And I would do the lettering. And I had a crush on him. He, we had nothing in common. But we ended up, long story short, falling in love, getting married. Our wedding night, we were like, let's build a life doing art, music, and writing. Because he was a musician. And my parents were like, oh. What, what happened to, oops, going out, is it going out? Okay, there we go, I think that's better. My parents were like, oh. Okay, that is my dad in heaven getting mad at me. <laughs> Sorry, dad. I think I need another, this one keeps cutting out a little bit. But, um, so we decided that's what we wanted to do. So I put writing aside. And we decided to work on our art because we were both artists. We got married, had, you know, our kids were toddlers, and we were literally making a living with my husband's band money. I was his band manager, and then I would make different things to sell, and we took these things into a store. Like, I made a book. Is that better? Okay. I, I got a canvas board and I put 12 pairs of earrings that I made and I took them into different boutiques. So my thinking was that they could buy the whole board for $100, have a display, and have 12 pairs of earrings. And it was just enough to pay for our electric bill. Little did I know that that was really a good idea for merchandising and packaging. And, but at the time, I, was, I just thought, we need to pay this bill. Well, one of those clients happened to be a sales rep. And we didn't know what a sales rep was, but she said, you know what, give me samples of everything, and I'm going to take these items to a trade show. 
And I told my husband, we just need to make up one of something fabulous, a whole bunch of different things. We went to Michael's to the clearance section, bought all of those things, gave her all of these samples, like 60 or 70 different items. We didn't know what to expect next. Three months later, we get a stack of 300 orders in the mail from the trade show. And I was like, oh my gosh, we made it. Like, this is it, this is a big deal. Like, we're gonna have our handmade things like all over the country. And so I look at the first order and it's like, oh, this one's for six magnets. This one's for 36 flower pots. This one's for 100 magnets. Button covers, what are but? did I make button covers? Well, we need to make 20 sets of those. And it was like 60 different items we made all with, from the clearance thing, like, I'm like, they don't, they're on clearance for a reason. They're not coming back again. <laughs> and so we had to really configure how we were going to get these orders out. And this is a truth talk moment, okay? Like, we had zero funds, but we lived next to a liquor store. So I'm like, we can get those boxes, and we can cut up the boxes and paint them and cover, you know, make magnets out of them for the magnets. They looked beautiful by the time they were done. And I put, these are upcycled, recycled from, you know, we, we're, we really care about the earth. And so instead of buying, this was in the mid nineties and people like in Scottsdale and like all over, they were like, wow, this is amazing. And I'm like, and our people, Mexican people were so resourceful, you know, and like we're carrying on the tradition. And oh, we, by the seat of our pants, we were getting these orders out. But during that time, there was no PayPal, there was no um, you know, computers to be able to run. People would give us checks, and their checks would bounce, or it would be net 30, and I would have to call. I'm like, hello, this is Susie from the finance department. Like, making up all of these voices. I even had my little sister do it for me. And the breaking point, I knew it was coming. I didn't know when or where, but the point came to where we got one order from Santa Fe Perfume for 10,000 hand-painted lizard flower pots. Wow. And in my mind, I'm like, this is it. Like, we're going to make enough money to make it back, to turn the corner. And I told my husband, I go, I have great news. And he still jokes to this day that every time I say, I have great news, he's like, oh, no. Like, <laughs> this could go either way. And I go, we have an order for 10,000 of your lizard flower pots. And he goes, I quit. <laughs> and he goes, look at my lizard flower pots. This was an order of 12, and they look like baby dinosaurs. Like, they don't even look like lizards anymore. And he's like, Kathy, this is not being an artist. This is like a sweatshop in our house. And he goes, this is not what we signed up for. And, oh, it was just like that horrible feeling of like, okay, when do you throw in the towel? You know, like, I didn't exactly know how to solve this problem, and we like decided to stop taking new orders, and I thought back to my dad in the newspaper, and I looked up in the newspaper, they had an opening for the tear sheet room. This is in the basement where they, you have to find an ad in the paper and tear it out and like send it off. And not a very glamorous job, but I got the job. It was a part-time job, and it just felt so good to be out of the house and doing something mindless where I wasn't, all I had to do was look for the ad and cut it out, and it was just so wonderful. And the newspaper had always been my ultimate goal of the features newsroom of the Arizona Republic. One day, the editor of the features department comes in. She's looking for an old article. And she came in and she was tall and statuesque, like beautiful brown hair and heels, just the way I thought a features editor would look for a national newspaper. So I got that issue for her and I told her, um, you know, I go, I love the feature section, fangirl hair feature section of the newspaper. I'm here in the basement. If you ever need anything, just come and call on me. And she's like, okay, thank you very much. <laughs> And wouldn't you know, they had an opening for a features clerk. Like she put out an opening for a features clerk. And I thought, you know what? I'm going to apply for this job. And 
I listed all of the requirements and that you needed to be in school or already have your journalism degree, and all of these things that I didn't have. And I thought, you know what? I'm in the basement in the tear sheets. What have I got to lose? If anything, I can go in and see what the newsroom looks like, right? And like do a little stalking and everything, and then come back and dream in the news in the basement. And I went for the interview with her, and I walk in, sit at her desk, and she has one of my hand-painted flower pots on her desk that she had purchased at a store, like at the Phoenix Art Museum. And I told her, I know this is inappropriate, but I painted that flower pot. And she said, what? And I said, yeah, I have a side business, you know, and like I paint stuff. And then she goes, oh my gosh, I love your work. And we hit it off, we started talking, and she said, I would love to hire you for this position but I can't because I need to hire a journalism student. Have you thought of going to night school to finish your bachelor's? I'm like, that's out of the question. You know, like, there's no way, you know, my husband's a musician and I'm an artist. Like, there, there's no way and we have two little kids. And she said, oh, well, thank you for taking up the courage to apply and come in. It was just so nice to meet you. I hope our paths cross again. And it was a great interview, except I didn't have the requirements. And I thought, well, that's okay, you know, and, and I thought, I'm just happy to be in the building, like to work in the basement, it's here I'm at the paper, I kind of fulfilled the thing of what I talked about with my dad. The next day, they, I'm in the basement working, and they go, Kathy, you have a phone call. And it was Maren Bingham, the editor, and she said, I just have a feeling about you. She goes, I want to offer you this position. And I was like, what? <laughs> So next thing I know, I'm the features clerk at the Arizona Republic, and that led to, I mean, I made flower pots for all the reporters. I like reorganized all of their file folders, inputted all the recipes, anything. I just loved being there. The home editor came and talked to me and said, you know what, we had a craft columnist and she quit, and we were wondering, since you have this side business, would you like to do a Saturday craft for the paper? And I thought, oh my gosh, I would have my name in the paper with something that I made. And I started doing that. And it, it was really intimidating because at the time, that's when Martha was like on the rise. She had her PBS show. And I'm like, I got to do my homework. And I got to like, you know, bring what Martha's bringing. And I remember watching PBS and I'm like, oh, that is not my style. Like it was like teal and cream. No glitter, no sequins, and I thought, okay, so maybe I just do my style, and I put meaning behind it, so they're very meaningful crafts, and then I could tell people to do their own version of what they like, so I could be, I know this has triple gloss glitter, and, uh, you know, a lot of varnish, so if you don't like the varnish, you can use matte, but here's the general idea. Within a year, Gannett News Service picked it up to, to syndicate it to hundreds of papers all around the country. And here I was, still a news clerk, and I was doing columnists. I was a newspaper columnist, but getting clerk pay. And I was happy with that. I was like, I'm just happy to have this. And the day changed when we got a female managing editor. And she, I was telling Maria about this on the drive over here, and she scared me. Like, she replaced all of the top editors with female editors. It was like girl power all the way. And she would come to my desk and she'd go, Maria, why don't you go back to night school and finish your bachelor's? And I'm like, it is out of the question. I, there is no way, because at this time, I had already started Crafty Chica at nighttime, and I was blogging from 10 o'clock to like 2 in the morning craft projects, different stories about my kids. I had that, but I actually had got my first book deal by then, making shadow boxes and shrines. Plus, now I was working full time at the paper, and we still had some of our art orders, plus the two kids, and then, so my husband and I, we had our hands full. And I'm like, it's impossible, there is no way. And she said, so you're just gonna settle for get, making pennies as a clerk when you're doing the work of a columnist who makes triple the amount what you make. And I'm like, I'm fine with that. I'm just happy to be here. And the news, she goes, go sign up. It's like tuition, we're gonna cover your tuition. And she scared me so, she scared me straight <laughs> into college. <laughs> so I hated it. I went in kicking and screaming, but there was no way. How could I say no to that? 
And it took three years, and I, the reason I had stopped going to college was because of math. So I had to go to all these study groups, and right away, any excuse I brought up, they shut me down, and they were like, you need to just pass this test. Like, we don't care about anything else. We're all struggling. Like, I'm like, okay, okay. But you know what? I, I finally graduated, and the day that I, I found out that I had completed everything, I went into work, and they had this big cake, and I'm like, Ooh, who's the cake for? I want that quarter piece. And they go, the cake is for Kathy because she went to night school and finished her bachelor's degree. And, and I just, that really was, from that day forward, I got my columnist pay and that I had worked so hard for. And I loved my job at the paper. Oh, <laughs> you know, I was covering entertainment and interviewing movie stars. Everything was going swell. And then things happen in your life, like if you get a little too comfy and you know you're meant for something else, have you had that happen where you get those signs and you kind of push them away and you think, no, that's out of the question. I can't, you know, no, just stick with what is safe. And for me, being at the paper with the salary, 401k, all of that was like, how could I give that up? And what happened was I, they changed around editors and I got this new editor who was just always grumpy. And now she's retired and happy. I ran into her at a coffee house and she's like just living her best life right now. But at the time, I would literally, I'd be driving into work and like, I wish for one day she wasn't there just so I could have peace because she just was every, you know, everything was wrong, micromanaging. And I went into work and they go, oh, you know, she's not here. She fell off a ladder last night. And I was like, oh my God, did I make her fall off a ladder? Like, you know? And then the guy next to me, he goes, collective energy, Kathy. Like, he goes, I shook the ladder, you know, like we were choking. But it made me think, I don't want to live my life like this. Like, maybe it is possible that there's something else. And I thought, could it be Crafty Chica? Because I wasn't getting paid for my blog. It was a strictly passion project. I love to write and I love to make things and share it with people. So every night that's what I was doing on my website was posting that. And I said, I always heard my mom's voice, you know, you can't make a living from glitter and glue. You can't make a living from glitter and glue. And I was in a Barnes and Noble store and I was just feeling that kind of way where, you know, when you feel like maybe all hope is lost, what direction do I go in? What am I doing with my life? You know, where am I gonna be in 10 years? That kind of thing. And I found that book, The Secret, and I couldn't even afford to buy it, but I read through it. And I remember that night I went to bed and I said, okay, you know what? I'm ready to do something else. Like I am opening myself up to take that chance to the next level, whatever that is. And if it's Crafty Chica, I accept that I've worked hard on that and maybe something will come from that. I'm confident for that. I ended up going to the craft convention. They have like this international craft convention and I wasn't invited, but I had my book publisher had a booth there. So I called her and I said, can I be a guest author in your book? I'll pay my own way, I'll do everything to get there, I just need to get in the door. And she said, sure. So I got my outfits together, I got all these high heels, everything, I go to the craft convention ready to like introduce myself because there's no, at the time there was no Latino representation in the craft industry. I put on these high heels, all, I saved every penny to get there, and then my feet started killing me. Like, I didn't even make it to the show floor. And I, I remember sitting down. I remember sitting down. Whoops. Okay, there we go. And, like, watching people audition for the DIY network and just wanting to cry because I'm like, how? I can't walk barefoot in the store. And I, like, went on this message board, this crafty message board, and the crafters in Atlanta, they wrote me and said, Kathy, we're going to pick you up at 6 o'clock and take you to Target to buy sneakers. And so <laughs> there was, like, you know, six of them in the car. They pull up. They're like, hop in, girl. And we, like, went to Target. I shopped for my sneakers, and I went back, and they're like, go kill it. Like, go to the craft convention. And that's all I needed was to get in the door. And from there, I was able to pitch myself as a speaker for the next year 
And at the end of that next year's presentation, that's when, at the end of my presentation, I had manufacturers lined up to offer a Crafty Chica product line. And so this coincided, <laughs> it coincided with the newspaper thing, and I picked my favorite one, which was Aileen's Taffy Glue and Puffy Paint, Tulip, all of that. And I thought, okay, if it's going to happen, it's going to happen with them. Go big or go home. Like, this is my one shot out of here. So I need to put a crazy wish list together. And I think this crazy wish list was because it was half crazy because, in, again, enthusiastic desperation. I knew I needed to level up. But it was also fear-based because I kind of wanted them, to, I wanted it to be so crazy that they would say no and I could stay at the paper. So we're at this lunch and the vice president of the company is sitting there and I, I had given her my wish list the week before and she said, okay, we agree to everything on your list. And I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> So then she writes this number down on the card and gives it to me of the salary. And I was like, oh my God, like, is this right? And I, I still paused for a moment. And wouldn't you know, next to me, this guy goes, hey, Kathy. And he was a former designer at the paper. And I said, oh, hi, his name is Joe Willie Smith. And I go, how's it going? And he goes, great, ever since I left the paper. <laughs> And I go, I looked at her and I said, I accept, I accept, like, this is a sign if I ever saw one. And she got up and hugged him, like, now they're good friends. But talk about having the opportunity of a brick falling on your head to say yes. And I never looked back. And it, you know, if I had followed all of those rules of, like, you know, it's good to follow rules, but it's good to also, well, everyone's going through the front door to find that side way in. And after going through these different challenges and saying, okay, wow, I conquered that. Okay, I'm gonna, what is the next thing I could do? And the next thing that had always been on my dream list was to write a novel. And this was during the time that I was at the paper and I was covering entertainment and I sat in the critics area. There was the arts critic, the film critic, you know, the, um, all of them, they were like really tough men that they did not cut any slack for anybody. And I remember the day that I went in, and it was for National Novel Writing Month. And I said, you know what? I'm going to write a novel for National Novel Writing Month. And they started laughing. And they're like, oh, Kathy, oh, ho, ho, ho. And, you know, one guy was like, I've written three novels. They're in my file cabinet at home. And I, and I thought, oh, you know, I was kind of embarrassed, like, okay, now maybe I went too far. Like, who do I think that I could write a novel when these guys are, you know, critically acclaimed arts writers? Like, they should have the published novel, not me. And I still went ahead and I did that National Novel Writing Month, joined a book group, a local writers group, which I highly suggest if you're working on any writing is to work with other people. And it got to the point to where I could submit it to my book agent. And I submitted it to my book agent, and he said, okay, I'm gonna call you um, on Wednesday. And I'm like, wow, and he was in New York, and I'm like, here's a chance for me to show up these guys, like to show what, what I'm doing here. So I told him, call me at 10, and I'm like, I'm gonna put up the volume because I want them to hear, like I'm talking to my New York book agent. And so he called me, and I'm like, everybody at 10, could please be quiet because my New York book agent is calling about my novel I completed and I submitted to him and they're like whatever you know like working on their things he calls me and I'm like yes and I go I'm ready to talk about the book and he goes this thing is a mess <laughs> he goes this is like it makes no sense have you ever read a novel do you understand what happens when the character at the beginning of the book and the end of the book, like, I don't even know, I didn't even make it halfway through, like, there's nothing I can, I'm like, <sighs> and as I'm writing the notes, they're turning into just scribbles, and my tears, I remember from it was one of those felt big pens, and my tears would fall and, like, turn into a puddle of ink, and, <sighs> yeah, at the time, I was not thinking crafty, at the time, I was just so humiliated, and I go, okay, thank you anyways. And I hung up 
and it was so silent. And they were like, the guys around me, they'd go, wow, I'm sorry, Kathy. You know, you're so good at crafts, though. Like, just keep doing it. That's what you're really good at. I'm like, I know, yeah. I, you know, it, at least I tried. I'll, I'll be right back. <laughs> and I went to, like, the seventh floor bathroom, ugly cry, slide down the wall kind of thing <laughs> of just embarrass and regret of thinking all the time I spent where I could have been helping my kids, you know, my son was struggling with math, and I gave up, you know, I could have spent more time helping them, and so I'm like, I'm so selfish, I shouldn't have done it, just everything you can think of, and I'm like, I'm not even going to try this again, and I put it away, and the way fate works, I ended up getting hired to teach a shrine-making workshop for Latina authors in Miami, and so... <laughs> I'm like helping them with their books and feeling like I am not in their league. And they got up and took turns reading excerpts from their novel. And I went to the panel. My problem was I didn't educate myself on it. I just started writing. I should have planned and prepared and researched. And then I knew exactly what I did wrong and I knew how I could fix it. I got home. I told my husband, this is like a montage scene in a chick flick where I'm like going home, I know what to do with my novel. Here are TV dinners for everybody. You know, leave mommy alone. <laughs> and I reworked it and that book agent happened to transition out and a new lady came in and I sent it to her and she said, my mom is a crafter. She goes, I love this book. It needs some work, but I can sell this book. She ended up selling it, and I got a two-book deal from Haché Books. And it ended up, the day that it went out into like nine different publishers, we had three that I got to interview those editors on who would be the publisher of the book. Like, one was HarperCollins, and it was just an amazing experience. And it was just so funny when years later, my first book cover came in the mail, and I shoved it in my purse. I was like, oh, yeah, good, okay, I'll look at it later. And I had to go to a reunion for the paper. And one of those critics, he's like, remember when Kathy tried to write a novel? Remember when her book agent? And I go, oh my god, guess what came in the mail today? And I like pulled it out. And I said, I ended up finishing it, and I got a two-book deal. Look, this is the cover. And she was like, oh. I mean, I didn't plan it. I did not plan it, but it was one of the most glorious moments of my life of that redemption of like anything is possible, but you have to like prepare yourself and educate yourself on you know how to get ready for it. And even with painting all of those magnets and flower pots, you know, that we did, we did 300 flower pots for Bloomingdale's in the early days. I thought, I will never hand paint that many pieces. Next time, I'm going to design and have them manufactured. So through working with you know, the product lines, I learned how to design and license my designs. And now I have like six different product lines that are out all over the world. So every year I get you know, like those royalty checks four times a year. So I've learned the art of like, but it took me going through the mistakes and the failures to learn how to do it the right way. So my best advice is that if there's something that you love to do, like pay attention to it, give yourself the time and the opportunity to play with it, to make mistakes, to learn from it, and then build a plan. That is like the best thing. And like, one of my things that I did in every single instance was I always had an end goal. Like for the novel, my end goal was seeing the book on the new in fiction counter at Barnes and Noble. And everything bad that happened, I just kept that vision of seeing the book on the new in fiction table. And I didn't stop until I got to that point. And it was just, I didn't even, um, I think I had my paint clothes on that morning and my sister drove me and I'm like, let's go take pictures. You know, I even called the bookstore, I'm coming in, my dream, I need a picture, make sure that book is on that table, you know. <laughs> so they like to set it all up and everything. So have that end goal and even with Michaels, I had an end cap in Michaels for eight years and I was like, okay, that vision was seen every time I went into Michaels, I would say someday I'm going to have my 
end tab there, and there's going to be a big sign that says Crappy Chica, eight years. I had that for eight years. And after eight years, though, I thought, what else is out there? Like, I want to change this up. Because every time you get too comfy, it's time to mix things up. And even though people say life is short, it is short, but it's also long. Like, there are the days, I mean, I'm 53 right now. I'm halfway to what are we going to do with the rest of our time? I feel like we put all our energy into our 20s and 30s and 40s of building our career, then when we get to 40 and 50, it's time to really pursue your passion and start a second career of what you always wanted to do. And it doesn't matter about age or your situation, you just have to plan it the right way. There are sacrifices you to make along the way, and you know when you approach those, like how to balance things out. You know, when I talk to women that are like, I don't have any time in my schedule. Wednesdays is Dancing with the Stars night, so I can't. And I'm like, how is that going to help you get to your end goal? You know, like everything that comes through, I say, is this closer to my goal, or will it take me away from my goal? Is this closer to someone else's goal? Like, who can I pay this forward to to help someone else? So if some, an opportunity comes, and maybe it's not right for me, I always know someone who I can you know, say, I know the perfect person for you. Well, this will work. And so it's just that magic of, of like always keeping it going. And it's OK to balance several things at one time. You know, my kids growing up, they always were there to help me. And now then when they were teenagers, they could never say, I don't have time, because I'm like, Oh, don't talk to me about not having time because you know, doing work, going to school at night, and then doing work during the day, and just everything. But at the same time, with our kids, how many of you have kids now? Like, are they teenagers? You have teenagers. So, let me tell you a, a good thing with the state that we are now with social media. Both of my kids, my daughter, she saw what I did and helped me, and she went on to create comedy videos. She works at BuzzFeed in LA now. And my son, he has his own site called The Geek Life. So he has a staff of 50 people and runs his site. So they both took the business model that I built with Crafty Chica, and they found a way to make their own business for themselves. So my daughter took it doing comedy videos. Now she's a producer and a writer over there which comes in handy because she'll come home for a weekend and I'm editing a YouTube video and she's like, Mom, that font is so outdated. And I'm like, well, what is the newest trending font? Okay. <laughs> so sure, her now she comes in handy to help me in other ways. And my son, you know, he his, his side is all on gaming and cosplay. We went to one of his events recently and there's a cosplay girl that I was like, woo, okay, you know. <laughs> And so, you know, I'm really proud of them that they took what I was doing and they were able to go on and do their own thing. And that is my biggest message to all of you is that anything is possible. You know, every time someone tells you no or gives you a list of reasons why it won't work, what have you got to lose? You might as well try it and give it your all. Don't be lazy about it. Like, you have to be passionate. If it's not a hell yeah, it's a no. That's one of the quotes that I love that I've heard out and about is that if it's not a hell yeah, it's a no. And the other thing is when we say, I don't have time, what we're really saying is it's not a priority to me. So that one was a hard one when someone told me that one time and I started using that, it really hit home because I had to say, you know what? This is a priority to me, so I am going to make this happen. And then it comes true with other things. It's like, you know what? It's really not a priority, so it's OK. I'm going to let this go. Another thing I do with my goals is I plan them out. Like, if I get a good idea for something, I'll say, I'm not going to drop everything and do this right now. I'm going to do this you know, in, after the new year. Or, and I actually schedule it in. I'll put. Um, in my notes, a calendar, a reminder to send me a reminder, and I put all my notes there. I even pre-schedule emails to myself. And like, I'll pre-schedule an email that'll say, just in case today is weird, you got this. Like, just keep pushing, and you know, this is, your today is a 
happy day that I'm writing this. So just remember days like this when you're having a bad day. And it's just so fun. It sounds weird, but do that. Or maybe you, you get a group of friends together, and you can send pre-scheduled notes like that to each other. I use an app called Boomerang. And it just really comes in handy for when you want to give up, but you know you should keep pushing. So that is my presentation. I hope it helps you guys so much. Thank you for having me. And you can find me at craftychica.com. You can follow me on Instagram at craftychica, Twitter, any of those. I'm always posting stuff, and I love to hear from all of you. So good luck with all of your projects. Thank you.